Good morning to you. It's seven o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. Now, with the eyes of the world on the UK for COP26, it's really not a good time for the sort of headlines facing the Prime Minister this morning. There are accusations of chaos in number 10 over the Owen Paterson lobbying case, with some Conservative MPs questioning Boris Johnson's leadership. We'll talk to the Education Secretary, Nadim Zahawi, shortly. And later in the programme, we'll hear from Labour's Shadow Scotland Secretary, Ian Murray. Plus, what scouts across the world are doing to help combat climate change. We'll talk to the UK's chief scout and adventurer, Bear Grylls, this morning. Ben? Let's live in harmony. Make global peace. A new song for remembrance. We'll speak to the composer, Jamie Lonsdale, at 9.45. It is Friday, the 5th of November. I've never felt more unsafe on set. In a UK exclusive interview, a senior member on the Alec Baldwin film Rust tells Sky News the fatal shooting of a cinematographer could have been prevented. I've never felt I was more in danger of dying on the set or on the drive home. So I was exhausted. Taking climate change to the classroom. New plans for children to be taught about protecting the planet. Devastating delays, the impact of the pandemic on couples being made to wait for IVF treatment. Shall we wail? Shall we fly? Shall we dance? A total one-off. Tributes to the dancer and entertainer Lionel Blair, who's died at the age of 92. The weather today dry but cloudy for most of us. The weekend should be a little bit milder. Morning to you. A senior crew member on the film Rust has told Sky News he never felt as close to death as he did on the set in the days before Helena Hutchins was killed. Lane Looper was the lead camera operator but resigned the day before the cinematographer was shot dead with a live bullet fired by Alec Baldwin. In a UK exclusive interview, Looper says Hutchins' death was absolutely preventable. He's been speaking to our US correspondent, Martha Kellner. I've never felt more unsafe on set or off set, you know. I have never been, I've never felt I was more in danger of dying on the set or on the drive home. So I was exhausted. Lane Looper was the head of the camera department on Rust, working alongside cinematographer Helena Hutchins. She was shot dead by the film's star, Alec Baldwin. Lane is speaking out now because he says his friend's death was caused by cutting costs and cutting corners. This set was unsafe simply because they didn't have the wherewithal to, you know, follow, you know, safety rules that we have in this industry that we've been following for decades. Do you believe that Helena's death was preventable? Absolutely. Absolutely. The thing is Looper resigned from the film on safety grounds the day before Hutchins' death. Sky News has seen a copy of the letter he sent to a production manager. He warns of two accidental firearms discharges and says the filming of gunfights was played very fast and loose. How will you remember Helena for people who didn't know her? What, what was she like? She was approachable. She was talented. Um, she was going places. We became friends really quick. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, it just hurts to lose a, lose a friend like that. In a statement, the producers of Rust said... Mr. Looper's allegations around budget and safety are patently false. Safety is always the number one priority in our films, and it's truly awful to see someone using this tragedy for personal gain. The police investigation into Helena Hutchins' death is ongoing. One of the central questions they're considering is why exactly live ammunition was on a film set at all. This is a typical pistol that would be used in a, a Western. It's been musing and, uh, too to Douglas Stewart. He was one of the actors on Rust, seen here with leading lady Frances Fisher. He had a positive experience on set. The master would open up the cartridge here. But he's now joining calls for real guns to be banned on films. For there to be a live round in a gun handed to an actor, 
unconscionable, unbelievable. Uh, everybody in my acting community, we were stunned. Just uh, couldn't believe it happened and uh, still can't. Those who worked with Helena Hutchins say she would have become one of Hollywood's leading cinematographers. They now hope her legacy can be that of safer sets for cast and crew, a legacy which means a similar tragedy cannot happen again. Martha Kellner, Sky News, New Mexico. Well, still to come for you this morning, as thousands of young people are expected to march through Glasgow today, I'm going to be talking to two climate activists about the role that young people play in protecting the planet. Well, also heading to the city today are a group of mothers from around the world who want leaders to stop financing fossil fuel projects for the sake of their children's health. I'm going to be talking to one of them at about a quarter to eight. And the Shadow Secretary for Scotland, Ian Murray, will be live on the programme at five past eight this morning. Now, Boris Johnson may want attention to be focused on the efforts to tackle climate change at the COP26 summit, but he's having to deal with the very unhappy atmosphere at Westminster and the fallout from the Owen Paterson row. Let's talk to the Education Secretary, Nadim Zahawi, who's at the COP26 summit in Glasgow. It's good to see you this morning. I mean, when it comes to this Owen Paterson issue, with hindsight, uh, do you think that this shouldn't have been pursued, that the, the suspension should have just been left to, to continue? Well, I think it's important uh, to remember that the Prime Minister, and in your opening remarks, you talked about uh, today's summit and youth and, uh, of course, um, uh, climate is incredibly important and it's Youth and Education Day here in Glasgow. But the Prime Minister has always been very clear that you know, paid lobbying is uh, not allowed. Uh, the, uh, I think the mistake... Uh, which, to your point, to your question, is uh, the conflation of creating a fairer system with the right of appeal uh, for parliamentarians um, to be able to put forward um, effectively you know, an appeal process and then conflating that with a particular case of Owen Patterson was a mistake. And I think the leader of the House, Jacob Rees-Mogg, came to the House yesterday. Upon reflection, yes, it was a mistake. And I think it was right to come back very quickly to the House and say, look, we need to separate those two things out. We should work on a cross-party basis to create a fairer system. I think that's a good thing. And my appeal to my fellow parliamentarians from all parties is, look, let's come together and create a better system with the right of appeal. And it was right to separate the two things out. That was the mistake, and I think it was right to reflect and return to Parliament and correct that. Uh, do you accept, then, that Owen Paterson did something wrong? Well, I think, look, the uh, uh, Commissioner had investigated and had come back uh, on uh, the uh, you know, investigation uh, around what Owen Paterson uh, was doing in terms of uh, his work for two companies. Uh, that is, uh, as I said to you, the Prime Minister has always been clear that, that paid lobbying is wrong. Um, and we need to separate those two things out. As I say, uh, the thing to focus on is not this particular case, but to focus on creating a fairer system with the right of appeal uh, for all parliamentarians. But are you voted for this for this change? Didn't you? I mean, I mean, obviously there was there was the the whip involved in this, but we know an awful lot of your your uh, colleagues on the back benches were really really uncomfortable with this. Why did you feel the need to vote for it? Well, again, I would uh, say to your viewers that I take collective responsibility. I'm a Secretary of State, uh, a Cabinet member in this government, and we voted uh, because I thought actually improving the system and introducing a right of appeal, as you would have in many sectors of the economy, in many professions, people have a, a right of appeal. I think your viewers would understand there's a fairness argument here. Uh, but upon reflection, I do think it's a mistake to have conflated that with a specific issue around the investigation into Owen Paterson. And I think it was right that we reflected on that and the leader of the House came back to the House uh, yesterday and you know, basically said as much that it was a mistake and we need to separate those th things out. And I hope we'll be able to return with proposals and have a cross-party agreement as to how we improve the system to introduce a right of appeal into it. I mean, was, how much of this 
change of heart and, the, and this 19-hour later U-turn from number 10 on this. You say it was because you didn't want to conflate the issues, but how much of that was driven by the fact that Ms. Mr Patterson told our deputy political editor he'd do it again? Well, look, I don't want to comment on uh, uh, anything that, um, you know, Owen Patterson said on interviews, uh, other than to say the Prime Minister made a very clear, clear statement um, recognising Owen Patterson's 24 years of service, recognising uh, that, let's not forget, you know, uh, there is a family here that have just lost a mother and a wife um, who he and his family were devoted to. And there's a bit, you need a bit of compassion in our hearts as well. Uh, but in saying that, the mistake that I think we want to correct is to separate that out and this particular case from what I think is the right thing to do and the fair thing and the, for Parliament to concentrate on is to get our appeals process in place uh, for all parliamentarians in the future. Well, I mean, Mr Patterson wants some compassion, doesn't he? When he's resigned, he said he stepped down to escape the cruel world of politics. I mean, a, a cruel world that, along with his lobbying, it was netting him about 200 or very nearly 200 grand a year. I don't think the public's going to be overly sympathetic, are they? And you need to bear that in mind. Well, I think the, 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 the public will uh, make their own judgment uh, on this. Um, all I would say is that um, you know, it's worth remembering that there is a family here concerned who've just lost um, a, a mother. Um, uh, there are children and, of course, Owen himself. Uh, but the public will make up their own mind on this. I think the priority has to be now for us, and I hope I can appeal to my colleagues across the House, let's shed our political differences aside. Let's not play politics with this. Let's get the system right, because the system does need a right of appeal, and that's the fairest thing to do. And that's what I think Andrea Ledson was trying to achieve with her amendment. Uh, now, that didn't work. I think it was right for us to come back to Parliament and for the Leader of the House to say, look, we think we made a mistake by conflating the two things uh, in one. And I think now is the time to come together and just deal with the, the, the process uh, well, I, to which we, you know, we hold ourselves to account. Forgive me, though. I mean, this has been an absolute shambles in terms of management, hasn't it, from, from number 10 down. I mean, even with I mean, one of your uh, colleagues, Matt Chorley, saying on Twitter, even if voters forget this shambles, Tory MPs won't. Scores of them held their nose, had arms twisted, faced abuse online and in post bags, and now Boris Johnson has made them look like idiots. They'll remember that the next time there's a rebellion. Well, as I say, look, the important thing is for all parliamentarians on all sides now to focus on what is truly material. What is material is, and I've spoken to uh, uh, the Speaker of the House, and I think he agrees with me on this, what's material is to uh, maintain confidence in the processes and the system that we have in place and improve it, if we can, through a right of appeal. That's something that's worth working on. That's something that's worth putting energy into rather than, you know, putting... Uh, you know, I'd rather focus on that than, than waste my, my energy and time on, on, on sort of, you know, tit for tat or being angry. OK. Well, what about apologising, then, to, to someone like Catherine Stone? Um, because, I mean, there are questions as to whether the Conservative Party has made her position untenable, through no fault of her own, actually. But Kwasi Kwarteng said yesterday she, should dis she, she ne now needs to decide her position. I mean, for, for what? For doing her job? Well, first of all, I think it's important to um, you know, remind all um, uh, yeah, parliamentarians and, of course, your viewers, the country at large, that Catherine Stone, uh, the Commissioner, works for the House. Um, uh, for Parliament, for the legislature, and I think it's only right that I echo, uh, you know, the words of the Speaker by saying, actually, uh, it is up to the House um, how uh, uh, the, 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 the Commissioner and the procedures actually are delivered. And I think that's the important thing to remember in this, and that's what I would, I would leave it. I was hoping we were also going to talk about youth and education day-to-day uh, -day at, at COP26, but, you know, happy to continue talking about the procedures of Parliament, if that's what you'd well, like well, to yeah, do. Well, yeah, we will talk about the youth in just a second, but, but one final point on this, then. There is an acceptance, is there, from what you say, that Kwasi Kwarteng did actually speak out of turn yesterday? Well, look, 
uh, as I say, it's important that uh, to remember, and I don't think Kwasi was saying anything different, that actually Catherine Stone, the Commissioner, uh, has a responsibility to the legislature, to the House of Commons, and the Speaker was absolutely right in reminding all of us uh, that that is uh, the correct thing to do. Um, uh, and, you know, look, you know, I'm happy uh, to continue uh, talking about this, but I hope we can also talk about what I'm launching today, which is uh, our sustainability and climate change strategy, which will, uh, I hope, support teachers to deliver uh, you know, evidence-led um, uh, education through STEM science subjects, through geography, and, of course, uh, uh, through citizenship uh, to our students, including the primary uh, model science curriculum at primary school as well. And, of course, we're launching a, uh, a, a national education park. If you take all our schools, nurseries, colleges and, and universities, they're about you know, t the size of two Birmingham cities uh, of parkland and land that we think we can create a, a sort of a virtual coming together of all of that uh, parkland to, to teach young people about biodiversity, about spatial planning, about uh, geospatial mm. mapping. All these things are incredibly exciting. And it's worth just, you know, I hope, leaning into youth and, 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 and uh, climate day today. Well, it's, it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, I, I don't think anyone's going to criticise a move to, to provide more education for young people when it comes to to climate, but I mean, the reality is at the moment, it's young people who are teaching us. Well, I think, one, you're absolutely right. And uh, uh, my nine-year-old Mia on Monday came back from school and said, Dad, you better be going to this meeting in Glasgow. I said, Mia, I'm absolutely going. It's a summit and it's bringing together over 190 uh, uh, world leaders uh, together because we really have to continue to try and deliver on, 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 you know, on the 1.5 uh, commitment. Uh, and you know, she was happy that I'm here and my team is leading in. I've got ministerial colleagues from the Department of Education but, I mean, for, here forg tomorrow. Forgive, forgive, forgive me for jumping in, but she, she's not there today. 50,000 young people are marching on COP26 today. I mean, do you support young people missing school to attend a march about climate change? Well, no, actually, because I, I'd rather they, they march on Saturday and Sunday. So the, the summit is here for at least two weekends. And what I would urge young people is not to miss school, not to miss class. We don't want to get into a situation where teachers and head teachers are having to actually fine and uh, issue fines uh, for missing education. Um, I'd rather they, they, they make their point on Saturday and Sunday. And they, they, I would absolutely support them uh, to do that this weekend and the weekend after that is the way to do it that is the way to continue uh, to take the message to world leaders and by the way the education part of this that i've just described to you including a, a climate leaders awards which we're going to be working with the princess trust and the duke of edinburgh awards to create these you know really i hope what will be you know world leading awards uh, that young people uh, can also use in 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 in, in you know, sort of later in life as they sort of hopefully go through their career paths um, will allow them not just to protest but also to think about their own career in science and technology and innovation. There's so much to do here, whether it be on fusion or offshore wind or solar or some of the new hydrogen technologies that are coming through, that all comes through education. So I want to be able to, I hope, inspire young minds um, on a Saturday or Sunday, if they are here, um, to say, look, you engage with us on this because it's important that you are part of the solution as well as part of the pressure on world leaders. Minister, good to talk to you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Now, India is the world's third largest polluter, but despite the country's prime minister telling the COP26 summit it was ready to become a climate action champion, it has an emergency on its own shoreline. As Katerina Vitozzi reports, a million people are at risk of rising sea levels in the Indian uh, Sundarbans, a collection of low-lying islands off the country's east coast. On this island, few places feel safe. Goramara was hit by a cyclone six months ago. It left many with nothing. Temporary shelters are now permanent homes. So, Saram, is this this is where you're living at the moment? Uh, 
Sanawara's family lost everything. This shack now houses five people. Here there is already no line between land and water. Few believe this island will be habitable by 2070, the year India, the world's third largest polluter, says it'll finally be net zero. Even now, salt water from the rising sea is poisoning freshwater reserves. We've got this meter here. We're going to take a measurement of the salt content in this pond, and it feeds into all the paddies around here. And theoretically, it's the end of the monsoon season, so this should be the freshest this water is ever going to be. Let's take a look. But look, yeah, even then, it's measuring 0.2%. So that means not only is this water still too salty um, for people to grow rice in, but it's also unsafe to drink. Fresh Fresh water is scarce, now used only for drinking. Everything else happens in these salty ponds. There are now desperate attempts to try and save what's left to make the island more resistant to intensifying cyclones. But many families have already left to a nearby bigger island. <laughs> Tuki Rani arrived here from Goramara eight years ago with nothing. But now this home, like every other across the Indian Sundarbans, is at risk. There are already calls for a planned retreat. One million people could be displaced, forced from their homes, from these islands that are slowly but surely disappearing. Katerina Vitozzi, Sky News, in the Indian Sundarbans. Well, you can see Katerina's documentary, Climate Crisis, Life on the Front Line, tonight at 9 o'clock on Sky News. Well, here's a look at the climate change as it's happening for you today. You can see the estimated temperature change compared to pre-industrial levels. This is now above 1.2 degrees. Under that, what we think is the carbon dioxide emissions, most of this coming from burning fossil fuels, and that continues to rise and, of course, feeding the temperature change. On the right, you can see the real-time power mix. This data comes from the national grid, and it illustrates the sources of our electricity generation at this moment in time, the renewables are wind, solar and hydroelectric. Well, for uninterrupted coverage of the summit, including special guests and analysis, you can watch Sky News Climate Live on Channel 525 and Sky Glass Channel 505. And let's have a look at the UK's latest COVID numbers for you today. And 37,269 new infections have been recorded in the last 24 hours. There have been 214 more deaths. That's the third day running that num the number has been above 200. It brings a total number of deaths within 28 days of a positive test to 141,395. Well, the new campaign has been launched to raise awareness of how simple ventilation can help reduce the risk of catching COVID-19 this winter. A short film shows how opening a window for just 10 minutes can significantly reduce the levels of the virus in the air while socialising. 
Now, hundreds of people waiting for IVF treatment have spoken of the devastating delays they face because of the pandemic. For some couples, the hold-ups could mean the difference between being able to have a child or not, and many have been able to get counselling. Milena Vest... It took 11 rounds of IVF for Amber to conceive her son. When she and her husband tried to give him a sibling, COVID shut all treatments down, putting her dreams of expanding her family in peril. For me, waiting eight months, I was already 37. And when you're, thir you know, when you're 37, eight months is a long time in fertility. And now we're at a year and a half down the line and I'm a year and a half older, more than that now, and we're still not anywhere. Um, so I think it's that, it's the time pressure that you'd have when you're late 30s that really kind of added to the, to the stress and the worry. A survey by the charity Fertility Network UK found that COVID delayed IVF treatment for more than half of the respondents. And that lost time, experts say, can make a difference between being able to have a baby or not. It does cause a lot of stress, particularly for women who are older and who have reduced egg reserve. The time is of the essence, and that puts additional stress on them because they are concerned about their egg reserve going down and their chances of having a baby with their own eggs. When treatment resumed for Lauren and Nick, COVID protocols meant they couldn't see a nurse to show them how to prepare medication and were given a booklet with instructions instead. It was just so hard to try and just read that without going having a nurse to go through it with and go, right, yeah, this is how you do it. Did you have any guidance as to how to do things properly? We couldn't ask any questions no. at all, really. There were no one to show us. No, there's stuff. nobody to show us, nobody to tell us what to do, nobody to reassure us even that we were doing the right thing. <laughs> Lauren got pregnant after three attempts, but for many couples, delays meant diminishing chances of having a much-wanted child. Milena Veselinovic, Sky News. Now, the former England captain, Michael Vaughan, has strongly denied an allegation of racism against Azim Rafiq and two other Asian players at the Yorkshire County Cricket Club. His comments follow an internal investigation which found Azim Rafiq faced racial harassment and bullying while playing there. Writing in The Telegraph this morning, Michael Vaughan said Rafiq had accused him of saying there are too many of you lot to three Asian players. The former England captain said, I completely and categorically deny that I ever said those words. Vaughan added, I have nothing to hide. The you lot comment never happened. Anyone trying to recollect words said 10 years ago will be fallible, but I'm adamant those words were not used. Prince Andrew's bid to have a US sex abuse civil lawsuit thrown out of court will be heard before a judge in January next year. The case being brought by Virginia Gaffray is expected to go to trial towards the end of next year, providing it's not settled or dismissed before then. A 21-year-old man has been charged after admitting seven counts of sending offensive messages on Twitter, which were sent to the police by Chelsea Football Club. In one tweet, Nathan Blagg said Spurs are on their way to Auschwitz. Our tributes are being paid to the dancer and entertainer Lionel Blair, who's died at the age of 92. Shall we wail? Shall we fly? Shall we die? Well, his career spanned eight decades, including appearances as an actor and tap dancer seen in this dance-off against Sammy Davis Jr. This was at the 1961 Royal Variety performance, but he is, of course, best known for being team captain on the TV game show. Give us a clue. But the singer Michael Ball called him a funny, kind, generous, compassionate and gifted man. So sad for his family and for our business. A total one-off. Bonnie Langford said, Dear Lionel, privileged to have been your dance partner. And the actor Sanjeev Bhaskar said, I love the fact he'd always pepper every conversation with a bit of a tap dance every single time. And it was glorious. He was on the show with me and Gillian, oh, three or four years ago now, and he was an absolute gent, a real charm. It was a privilege to meet him. 
Uh, now, let's have a look at weather for you. And, well, it's looking mainly dry before more unsettled conditions arrive tomorrow. But it will be milder over the weekend. Chilly out there with a widespread frost against England and Wales, especially in the south. Cloud in the north and west will become more extensive through the morning. But southeast England will hold on to the sunshine. Most places dry, but the west will see some light rain or drizzle. Now, if you're an original ABBA fan, you've been waiting 40 years for today. It's the release of their new studio album called Voyage, the first since the 1981 album The Visitors. And this is the trailer for the band's upcoming Voyage concert. And here we're showing previously unseen footage of the avatars in action. This is an incredible um, virtual sort of bodies they've been given. It's a short clip, they're not giving much away, but probably just enough to whet your appetite for the shows which start in May and by which time we should know all the songs on the album word for word, hopefully. I still to come on Sky News Breakfast for you this morning. I'm going to be talking to two youth climate activists about COP26 and the Fridays for Future demonstrations that have been taking place globally. Now, the Education Secretary has admitted the government made a mistake over the way it's handled the case of Owen Patterson in the House of Commons. Speaking to me earlier, Nadim Zahawi said creating a system of appeal for suspended MPs should not have been conflated with the case of allegations about lobbying by Mr Patterson. 
Upon reflection, yes, it was a mistake, and I think it was right to come back very quickly to the House and say, look, we need to separate those two things out. We should work on a cross-party basis to create a fairer system. I think that's a good thing, and my appeal to my fellow parliamentarians from all parties is, look, let's come together and create a better system with the right of appeal. And it was right to separate the two things out. That was the mistake, and I think it was right to reflect and return to Parliament and correct that. Let's talk to our political correspondent, Rob Powell. I mean, he used quite careful language there. Yeah, delicately put, as ever, but I think that's probably as close as you're going to get uh, to someone in government publicly admitting what an utter dog's breakfast Number 10's handling of this has been over the last um, 48 hours. Nadeem Zahawi saying it was a mistake to conflate the issues. Also, as well, I think, I detected a little bit of frustration with the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, who, of course, was in Glasgow yesterday speaking to Kay Burley and suggested that the Standards Commissioner, Catherine Stone, who conducted that investigation um, into Owen Paterson, Kwasi Kwarteng suggested, uh, essentially, that she may well be out of a job because they're reforming the system. Nadeem Zahawi said uh, that he would remind all parliamentarians that Catherine Stone works for the House uh, and would echo what the Speaker said yesterday when the Speaker ticked off Kwasi Kwarteng um, as well. So, again, delicately put, but I think we can read into that that people were not happy with what Kwasi Kwarteng said yesterday. In terms of where this all leaves us, uh, well, I think the government have soaked up quite a lot of political damage on this. You can see that a poll uh, taken um, overnight after this all came out showed that it's eaten into their lead against Labour. We'll also get a by-election in North Shropshire as well, and early talks have already started between the opposition parties about potentially fielding one anti-sleaze candidate that could be really the only chance of overturning the Conservative majority there. I think a word of caution, these uh, unity candidates sound good on paper, but often when it comes out to working out the practicalities, it's a lot more tricky. OK, Rob, for now, thank you. Now, saving the planet is to become part of the school curriculum. Let's join Ender Brady, who's at a school in West London for us this morning. Ender. Yeah, morning, Stephen. We're at Ark Burlington Danes Academy here in West London. Let's bring in head teacher Sophie Vellicott. Sophie, how much of your daily teaching life here, school life, is climate change and the environment? It's really important to our school and it's really important to our pupils. So we have some of the work that we do is part of the national curriculum and then there's other things that we do that support that through our non-examined curriculum and some other programmes such as Earth Warriors which we do in addition to our normal lessons. And you've signed up to be an eco school. You've just won your first green flag. What does that entail? Yeah, absolutely. We signed up in autumn and have been working all together through the programme. We have one particular teacher who leads on this and she's set up an eco committee, which is all about championing the pupil voice through the process and they make decisions around what they can do to improve their school. Tell me, how aware, say, are primary school age children of someone like Greta Thunberg, for example? Especially at the moment, one of our year six cohorts are doing a, a unit on global challenges and we've tied it, this in really, really smoothly, I think, with COP26 and with Greta's role in that. For the children to have a role model who is young, uh, relatable to them, and they can feel like they can be the change makers is both important to us as a school, but especially because it's part of our vision. Our vision is to, to develop little humans to be the change makers of the future. So really, climate change, the environment, it's all stitched into the curriculum very much. Absolutely, and I don't think the children would feel like it's an add-on. I think they would feel that it's part of everything they do at school. Sophie Velikoff, head teacher here. Thanks for having us. Uh, we're here throughout the day, Stephen, and it's interesting. The children uh, in year six will be having a debate later on where they pretend to be world leaders at COP26, and there will be a discussion and interviews and press conferences, and uh, we'll be filming all of it. Yeah, I wonder if they come up with some better answers than the actual world leaders will at the end of all of this. Ender, thank you. We'll catch up with you later. Well, as the focus of COP26 turns to youth and public empowerment, thousands of young climate activists are expected to attend a march in Glasgow. Some will miss school, part of the Fridays for Future movement, which sees students go on strike from school to take action against climate change. Well, let's talk to two climate activists, Dominique Lasota and Ashley Lashley. And I know, Dominique, you're um, part of, of the, uh, the Friday action. How important is it for you to get out and make your voice heard? 
I mean, it is absolutely crucial at this point because we see that the governments have not been treating us seriously since the beginning of this conference. You know, when we hear Boris Johnson coming in and giving us a nice speech, but actually at the same time, not stopping the Campbell oil field, you see that the ambition, the adequacy and the severity of this crisis, of treating this crisis is missing among the people in power. And so we have to march in a way because we see that there's no one out there who treats our lives seriously at this point. But at the same time, I think that, you know, we got so used to those marches on Friday. We got so used to young people having to go out of school and, and march on the streets. But we shouldn't get used to it. They shouldn't be there. They should be safe. And they should be safe because of political action that should have been taken by the government. But it's not. So let's not normalize it. Let's you know, bring out the anger because I feel so much anger and hopelessness seeing how the COP26 has been going so far. I mean, do you, do you go along with that, Ashley? Do you think that, that there is an element of betrayal from our, our leaders at the moment? Yeah, I can totally agree. Um, right now, your voices are significantly essential to bring about societal change within our different societies globally. And the time is now if governments really want to build a just and fair future for all, that they must take our views into consideration when developing their policies. And for right now, here at COP26, we are not included. Um, well, I was given the opportunity to join my Barbados delegation, but hearing lots of young person speak to the injustices that they're seeing here at COP26. I really believe that more youth involvement should be here at COP26. I mean, do, do you not think, though, Dominica, that uh, although the, 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 the movement, the, the change may not be fast enough for what you would like, do you not think that significant steps are being taken? Obviously, we have been talking so much about the climate crisis through the past three years as this wave of climate activism and human people has been you know, gathering incredible force. So definitely, climate crisis is a topic and it is one of the priorities. But if behind this, we don't see concrete action and we see, for instance, this empty coal agreement that was announced yesterday, while the Polish government, for instance, which is, which is my government, uh, still found a way to trick it and not actually commit to a coal phase out by 2030, we see that there's still so much to do while the climate crisis is accelerating at a significant, significant pace. And when it comes to hearing those young voices, I think there is a lot of youth washing actually at COP happening. You know, we see young people being invited to panels, we see young people being praised and, and you know, thanked for or their action. But this is in a way, you know, just another method for the people in power to say, okay, you know, we listen to them, we say we listen to them, but we don't change. And this must change because we are just, you know, nine years uh, behind um, the deadline. Actually, that will determine how our society, global society will look for forever, actually. I mean, it's interesting. You, you, you say that you know, they listen, but, but then don't do a lot about it. I mean, you formed, actually, the, the Hay Group, Healthy and Environment Friendly Youth um, in Barbados. I mean, how, in, how important is it then, if you don't feel you're being listened to, how important is it to, in effect, take matters into your own hands and try and dictate your own future? No, it is very important and that is one of the main reasons why I started the Hay Campaign. Because coming from a country like Barbados, being in um, a small island developing state where we're se severely susceptible and vulnerable to the impact that climate change is having on our lives, although our government has set ambitious targets. Developed nations also need to set ambitious targets. And the main reason behind the establishment of the Hay Campaign is because um, as young persons, we need to stand up for something. And every day in Barbados, we're witnessing the dramatic changes to our environment. So youth coming together, youth from the Caribbean connecting to those across the world to build bridges that are inclusive is important in today's decade because we really need to see that change from a society perspective to be more inclusive, vulnerable groupings. Um, recently, UNICEF um, launched a report that states that 100, that 1 billion children worldwide are being affected by climate change. And right now, climate change is a child rights crisis. So I love to see young people rising up to taking action because at the end of the day, our lives um, depend on the actions in which our governments take today. Ashley, Dominica, really good to talk to both of you today. Thank you. 
Well, this is Sky News Breakfast. Let's get a look at all the sport for you this morning with Jackie. Chase the pack, achieve your goals, and unlock rewards. Live life with Vitality and Zwift, the app that makes indoor cycling fun. This sports bulletin is brought to you by Vitality and Zwift. It's no surprise to anyone, you love the club. When did that start, you in Liverpool? When I was in Chelsea, then I came here, the atmosphere was unbelievable. Then I said, like, wow, I want to play here one day. And that's why when I was in Rome, and there is talk between the clubs, and they will say, I will go there, I would love to play there. The, the atmosphere is unbelievable. I want to come back to, you, to England to, to prove people wrong, and I didn't have my chance there, Chelsea, so I will go back for sure. So I came back. I also, when I was young, I was playing with Liverpool and PlayStation, so it's like there is kind of emotional between us, or between me and the club, so I just like, I'm going to go. So with that in mind then, the fact that it was a bit of a dream to come here, everything you've achieved, how much longer do you see yourself in the Red of Liverpool? You know it's a, you know it's a topic at the moment. This is not dependent on me, but if you ask me, I would love to stay until last day of my football, but I can't say much about that, not, not in my hand. Okay, can I ask you what it does depend on then? <laughs> depend on what the club wants, not depend on me. At the moment, I can't see myself ever play against Liverpool. That will make me sad, and it's it's hard. It's hard. I don't want to talk to it about it, but it's it it will make me really sad if I at the moment I don't see myself playing against Liverpool. But let's see what will happen in the future. What's left for you? You've now been Player of the Year in the Premier League, African Player of the Year. You've won the Champions League. You've won the Premier League. Thirty next year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think. Um, what more can you do? Uh, I can do a lot. I still, that's why I'm always focusing on the game, just to show some people that I can play in top level for many, many years. I think I'm in the top shape as well. I can play until 38, 39. I'm not worried about that. 39? Yeah. Until my, like, my kids say, hey, come play with us. Leave the football. That would be nice. Do you think can top players go? Live life with Vitality and Zwift, the app that makes indoor cycling fun. Jackie, thank you. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, the mothers heading to COP26 to put an end to images like this. They want fossil fuels to be banned. I'm Greg Milam, Sky's US correspondent here in Los Angeles. I've seen the dark side of America. I'm Stuart Ramsey, and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end, and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover, or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. To take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, they were right. Enormous explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that's just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network. 
not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but the pig we're drawing it's so, so hot. Does anyone know which particular parts of your body can be damaged by air pollution? Friday will start chilly with a fairly widespread frost across England and Wales. During the morning, cloud will become more extensive, giving patchy light rain in the north and west, but the southeast will hold on to the sunshine. For most, it won't be quite as cold as recently. The afternoon will be similar, but cloud will extend into the southeast of England. Air pollution levels are expected to stay low overall, but light winds may allow isolated pockets of moderate levels to develop near Diwali or early bonfire night celebrations. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. Now, she's a woman who's played the most famous and most glamorous characters in soap history. Alexis Colby in Dynasty, of course. Oh, what a classic. Now in her late 80s, believe it or not, Joan Collins is, of course, just as glamorous and just as outspoken, having published an uncensored memoir. Our arts and entertainment correspondent, Katie Spencer, caught up with her. From starting out during Hollywood's golden age through to playing one of the 80s most iconic TV characters, Dame Joan Collins' new memoir starts after Dynasty has ended. You don't mince your words in this book. Uh... I never mince my words. <laughs> I had this tiny tape recorder and I used to use it when I was working on Dynasty to learn my lines. I, it just gave me total freedom and I never, ever, ever thought it would be published. What we hear through your voice in this, we don't hear from modern celebrities at all because of cancel culture. Would you say that you're, you're anti-woke, that you sort of don't really care what people think? I really don't care that much what people think. Of course I do up to a certain amount, but I think that um, people are caring too much about having their opinions and not being able to say what they think. You can't have debates. You can't throw opinions about what you think about this particular thing. Statues being taken down, for example. You can't have that argument with somebody who wants statues taken down of people, um, who they are just belligerent almost. I, well, that's my experience. You talk about Boris Johnson in there. It's a brilliant description that you have, saying he looks like he brushes his hair with an egg beater. I, I mean, do you think he's got any better? Does, does Carrie need to have a word? Have you seen his child? His child's hair is even more wild than, than his. I like Boris. I worked for him. He was my editor on The, the Spectator. You talk about um, wanting to use stunt women. You talk about the importance of choreographing fights on stage Absolutely. as well. Look what just happened last month with the gun. I've worked with guns in films, and every single time that I, and I don't like guns, I've been given a gun, I said to the prop man, I said, please open it up in front of me so I can see inside to see that there's nothing in it. Can you even imagine what Alec Baldwin has been going through since this has happened? I can't even imagine. It must be hell. Just because it's COP26 at the moment, uh, you played the uh, ex-wife of an oil uh, tycoon on Dynasty, of course. Would that have worked if he, if he was doing wind farms? What do we <laughs> think of the... Uh... I don't think so. Life has moved on. Could celebrities do with perhaps, uh, in all seriousness, cutting down the, the private jets and what have you? Not just celebrities. Did you see the amount of cars that Joe Biden had? I mean, I, can, I was watching Sky News, of course, and I, I counted at least 10 cars. You see, I'm very opinionated. <laughs> but we love you for it. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking Thank to you, us, Thank you, Katie. Oh, she's a legend. So jealous of Katie. Now, you may have thought it only happened in the movies, but now 
It's all for real. NASA has introduced the first planetary defence test mission, a spacecraft it plans to launch later this month on a mission to crash into an asteroid. Calling it the dart. The goal is to determine whether the impact of the spacecraft will change the asteroid's course. Now, the asteroid in question is Didymus and its moon Dimorphos. Now, though neither poses a threat to the Earth, it is a useful test, according to NASA, best done before the real thing happens. Good point. OK, let's have a look at the weather for you. And today looks mainly dry, but there are going to be unsettled conditions coming in tomorrow, although it will be milder. So it's chilly out there today, widespread frost across England and Wales, especially in the south. Cloud in the north and west will become more extensive through the morning, but the southeast of England will hold onto the sunshine. Most places dry, but the west will see some outbreaks of light rain or drizzle, mainly on the coasts. East Anglia and the southeast will be rather cold again, I'm afraid to tell you, but maybe the temperatures will go up a little bit on yesterday. More to come in an hour.